It is Friday, June 22nd, 2018, and if you don't know what that sound is, those crying children ripped out of their arms of their parents, I don't know what the hell rock you have been living under this past week. Welcome to Raging Chicken's Out the Coop podcast, and yes, we are on fire today. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. Today's show, internment camps or prison camps, you make the call. After ProPublica's audio of kids crying in cages after being separated from families gets people's attention, suddenly we've got a movement. And right before the dam broke on this this week, Trump was receiving his highest approval ratings of his presidency, according to last weekend's Gallup poll. We're going to see what happens this week. And in Hungary, and the truly international movement that Trump is helping bring to bear, Homeland Hungary, homeland of Sebastian Gorka and his fascist-loving dad, passed Stop Soros laws and bans aid to undocumented immigrants. In a true test of tone deafness this week, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said, On World Refugee Day, we join the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees and our international partners in commemorating the strength, courage, and resilience of millions of refugees worldwide who have been forced to flee their homes due to persecution and conflict. What? And let's not forget that Democrats, yes, those centrist DLC Democrats, helped set the table for this shit show years ago. And hey, media, the brutality and racism is the freaking policy. You don't need to dig for this one. Let's not forget, this is the very week that the U.S. backs out of the U.N. Commission on Human Rights. How about that? And in coordination, you got Sinclair Media forces its affiliates to air segments blaming the media for overreacting about child separation. In connected news, Trump encourages white uh, Washington Post employees to strike after, hours after it dropped a huge scoop on Russian collusion. It was, however, good to see Rachel Maddow finally get off the Russia story for a bit and on to what's happening in their immigration right here at home. Lock her up! Lock him up! Lock him up! Paul Manafort goes to prison for witness tampering. Put into solitary confinement for his own protection. No Russian mobsters in jail. Ocasio-Cortez faces off against Joe Crowley for the heart and soul of the Democratic Party this Tuesday in New York City. Ocasio-Cortez is endorsed by groups like Our Revolution and Democratic Socialists of America. We are still waiting for the Janice V. AFSCME ruling to drop from the U.S. Supreme Court. There was a chance that it was going to come down today. Looks more likely Monday. And a new Republican-oriented polling firm released a poll showing that two-thirds of Americans and a majority of union households holds would support a ruling in favor of Janice, stripping away, you know... Whole lot of power from public sector unions. Not sure I'm buying it, but got to be aware. Melania, quite a freaking fashion show, wears a jacket on her way to Texas in the border as she's boarding a plane. Back of the jacket, what does it say? I really don't care. Do you? This is the freaking world we live in, folks. There's another world coming. You know, Mars. Oh, yeah. Chief Spokesman Elon Musk registered a domain this week called Pravda that would rate journalists' credibility. That's always, you know, nice to know. Speaking of Elon Musk, Musk goes on Twitter claiming that he's a socialist. And Marx was a capitalist because he wrote a book on capitalism. <laughs> okay. And he must be in Rocket Man. <laughs> PA budget is done. Much to say about that. 17 year old um, in the Pittsburgh area, Antoine Rose was unarmed, African American man, shot in the back and killed by East Pittsburgh police. A little on that today. And hey, shout out to all my brothers and sisters out there, all our progressive organizations, labor organizing, our labor organizations. Guess what? After this week, I hope it's clear. 
No need to ever, ever back anti-immigrant politicians for political expediency ever again if you hope to exist past the end of the decade. Colleen Bradley's whistleblower case headed toward the Supreme Court to petition for a writ of certiorari, 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 can never say that word, is in the Supreme Court, and we've got the hard copy. Now is the time to pay attention, to step up and get behind this case. 30 million public sector workers and the public's right to know about government corruption is at stake. And it's official. Yes! Space Force is official. It's not going to be, it's going to be another branch of the military, folks. And as Trump says, it's going to be separate but equal to the Air Force. (laughs) I guess, you know, hey, let's bring Jim Crow into all our language now. Cool news, though. Space Force may be used to help fight asteroids. Epic dust storm on Mars covers the entire planet, causing curiosity to go into dormant mode for a little bit. Reminder of, like, what our future planet may look like if we don't take care of this one. Canada legalized pot. That's good news. And Free Will hosts Sour Sunday number three for 2018 this coming Sunday. And they are bringing out the Pomisher and, yes, the Blushing Apricot. So, so cool. Remind everybody that we got a new podcast that we launched. Yours truly from Raging Chicken Press is teaming up with Colleen Fitzgerald from a home stony run to bring you our new podcast, Free Range. Free Range is focused on food, politics, and communities of resistance or communities as resistance. And what a better way to ground our political organizing than in the very ground we walk upon. The people, the places, and the process of sustenance and resistance. You can check out everything um, about this show. We're kind of migrating to our own separate page right now. But if you go to Free Range on Facebook, Free Range Podcast on Facebook, or you can start to check out freerangepod.com. Freerangepod.com is where our podcast will be located. I want to remind everybody to tune in to the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can stream the show live at freespeech.org or tune in on Dish Network, DirecTV, or through the Free Speech TV app on Roku. If you ever miss your show, just go to Free Speech TV, click on the archives, and look for Rick Smith. If we want a progressive future, and we want to avoid the kind of shit show we got going on right now in this country, we need progressive media. Not the Sinclair media people, not the media that you can threaten for access, but media that is homegrown, that is supported by the progressive community, media like Raging Chicken Press. And you can help support Pull No Punches, progressive media, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash RC Press and choose your membership level. With the 2018 midterm elections right around the corner, we need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. Best way to do that is to become a member of Raging Chicken. Patreon.com slash RC Press. You become a member for as little as five bucks a month. Sean, I'm on fire. <laughs> yeah, I could tell. <laughs> I have not, this is, I, I tell you, this is like, I, 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 I was getting ready. Look, my kids are home from school now. Um, and, you know, so they're going to be around while I'm doing the podcast today. So this morning I had to kind of explain to them a little bit more about what was actually happening at our borders. And I was filled with rage and tears at the same time and having to tell them that there are kids, toddlers, 18-year-old, like infants, being pulled away from their parents and sent into freaking detention centers where they can't even be touched by the people there. Not that you'd want those people touching your kids anyways. Yeah. And there's also reports coming out this week that these kids have experienced abuse at some of these detention centers across the country. Um, I don't know where we begin. Like, uh, are these even detention centers or are they internment camps? Look, look, let's call them what they are, man. They are internment camps or prison camps. That's why I'm saying you make the call. Like, they want to use, look, this is going to go down. This is going to be one of these. Center, tension center is a euphemism. Yeah, exactly. You can call them whatever the heck you want. You, well, all this is going to mean is that when this, this moment in history is looked back upon, right, determent, uh, determent camps or inter, whatever, uh, see, determent, I can't even say the damn word, detention camps are basically going to be, have the same inflection as prison camps or internment camps do to us now when we look back at it, simply because this, the horror of what this is and the fact that it is like that, that the Trump administration and every, and, and every freaking Republican 
Republican in leadership position in this country has been virtually silent other than like, oh, it sounds so bad. I've done virtually nothing on this is disgusting to me. Yeah, no. Uh... <laughs> this, this, yeah, this week is, uh, you know, one of the things I was keep on thinking going back to is uh, the, the day my eighth grade teacher came into class after the Iraq war started. And pretty much said, we're not doing anything. And because of how disgusted she was with the war with us starting. And looking back on that, I guess I knows I, I know how she felt after this week. And how, like how disgusted it feels, disgusting it feels to live in this country right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it is absolutely disgusting to live in this country. Um, you know, we have detention centers here in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's one in Berks County that people have been trying to get shut down. This is a family detention center um, where they keep the families together. But, um, you know, there, there, there's, there, there, there is a renewed call. There's a forced push to close this detention center right now. Um, and it, it, it's, it's going to become a PR nightmare for people if they don't act on it. Well, they better act on it. They better act on it. Because and look- it's not even like what's right or wrong. It's, it's not even, this, is, this is about morality at this point. Look, it's about morality. It's about our future. It's, it's about these rights. kids. I mean, it's like, look, I mean, I sat there. Were these kids, th- th- what, tens of thousands of these kids were were separated from the families? How many of these kids, like, there's going to be thousands of these kids that will never see their, their parents again simply because they were separated. And there's no going to be no way to track them. No, look, and look, and, I, I, I reunite them. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I just want to mention this and kind of come back to this where this point of connection is. Is that you know I've been following this Colleen Bradley case, like about uh, you know her whistleblower case. It's all about the protection of whistleblowers, public sector workers, right, and protection of whistleblowers in order to kind of come forward when there's government fraud, corruption, or, or abuse, right. This is here's the example of what we're talking about. Is that right now, the why that case has been so important to me is, number one, just the case itself. But number two, here we are right now. How do we know? How do well, the first time that we actually got word that so, well, what it was like inside there with that audio that was released from ProPublica, right? That was smuggled out. That was by a whistleblower that handed it off to a lawyer that handed it off to a journalist, Right. This is the kind of stuff we need to know about, because if you look at this is why I wanted to say that at the beginning of the week, right, when Gallup released its poll on Sunday and Trump had, what, 45 percent approval rating, the highest approval rating of his presidency, those immigration policies had already been in effect during that period of polling. Right. That had already been in effect. It wasn't until we actually got the actual now we're starting to get some actual pictures and the audio that came out that finally got the traditional media, the corporate media off their asses into the border, right? And got politicians out there to actually start putting pressure upon this stuff. The only way we know about this stuff is that when people are going to take the risk to come forward and to say for the good of us all under freaking God, if you like that, this crap cannot be done in our name. Yeah. And it's, we are going, (laughs) I feel like, like, with everything, I mean, you tie it in with the Melania Trump jacket. I mean, we are crossing like that event horizon. <clears throat> yes, in, into like a straight up like fascist society at this point. Like, do you think? <laughs> I mean, and this is just like this. This shows you how fast they can get these camps up and going. These tent cities that they're using. Um, I mean, they're they're putting children in tent cities in the fucking desert down in like texas or on the border like like sean I, here, here's this, like, it's just this is unfathomable it's unspeakable what? it's it's i mean i'm i am i'm past the point of like being pissed like about this i i i, I, I i'm pissed but like I, i'm still like speechless about it. like you know what i mean just like it is it, you're just watching this and it's like like what's going on here and you would think something like you know, jumping on the call to close down the Berks detention center would be a slam fucking dunk for Democrats in this in this state, but it's not. Yeah, look, I, it's not. And, no. and, and the argument I'm hearing is, well, what happens afterwards? You close down a detention center, and what happens afterwards? They get shipped to the border, and then they go into the conditions down the border. 
I mean, some of the arguments I'm hearing from people is like we have to make these detention centers better for people. Less shitty than what they are. A better deal than what a better these people deal. have. Yeah, a less crappier deal. Yeah. A slightly less crappier deal. Right? I, look, I, okay, I got several things to say here. So, number one, let me just start here. I'm going to try to just not yell into the microphone. Um, so, the first, the first one is this is that there's been a, a group of kind of discussions, right? Let, let's just talk about, uh, at first, at a, at a broader level. When we start talk, making allusions toward going down a fascist road, going down this author, authoritarian fascist road, right? There may be a time which, I, at least I felt, you know, uncomfortable about making that claim because it sounded, you know, okay, I had to question myself, am I being a little bit, you know, too outlandish here? I'm not at that place anymore. This is the road that we're on. And then I keep on hearing, from, well, no, because this is different, because it's not blah, blah, blah. We have this. And I'm like this. You know, look, here's, hey, what, here's, what, people, here's what people got to understand. Here's what people got to understand. You're set, the infrastructure for authoritarianism, for fascism, is being put in place right now. Right? Basically, you got to think about this. Is like we're in a choose-your-own-adventure book at this point. right? And the default mode is that everything is set towards fascism. All right. The only thing that will move the move it away from that is going to be mass action of resistance. That is all. And it's not going to be reason. It's not going to be like, oh, maybe there's going to be hopefully a change of heart. None of that crap. Right. The default road right now is toward fascism. And does it happen automatically? If we do nothing, yes. Now, thank God, people are finally kind of stepping up. And I think Sam Cedar on the Majority Report had it right this week when he was basically saying, when people are asking, what can I do? And you say, anything that you can do to be disruptive, whether it's a giant sign in your front yard that says, keep families together, whether it's showing up at churches or questioning your pastor about what or their going stance to is. Dinner, going, going to where they are eating dinner and shame these people in public. Yes, I think exactly. We should, I think we should go back to... Uh, you know, getting the rotten tomatoes, getting the rotten lettuce, getting to eggs and just start pelling these people in public with these things. Shame them in public. And yeah, you know what? Someone should throw an egg in someone's face because you know what that does? That gets that gets your attention. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think, you know, in Pennsylvania, has got a long tradition, like back going back to the Whiskey Rebellion, right, of tarring and feathering people. So you know, why I not? That, that, I know that we need to start flogging these people in public. We yeah. need to start showing up like this is this is our like quote unquote tea party moment. You know, this is, you know, 2010, they cried about death panels. Well, here we have internment camps. If you are not going to your Republicans, uh, your representatives um, meetings or committee meetings or something like that, and not shouting these people down in public or not bird dogging them in public and shaming them and making them feel uncomfortable where they live or not showing up to their offices and doing that, then you're, you, then, then you're rolling over. Well, I look, I, I, I'm willing to say, look, that's not your only option. Yes, you do that, but you do anything that you can. Going to a protest, going to a rally, but like making it known that these people you, are like in our communities. I can't tell you how important it is right now that in our communities that there is no space where you go to. You just walk away from this stuff that our neighbors are aware that we are not going to, to stand behind this. That if like, they are going to stand with the racist and the fascist, right, they're going to have to contend with us as neighbors for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, you can't be neutral on a moving train. The Howard Zinn quote. Yes. Like this, this is where, like, this is where we're at. Like, you know, like it's exactly what Zinn said. You can't be neutral on a moving train. And either you pull the emergency brake or you stay still and, and just take it on the chin. And this, I mean, like this week is, I mean, this, we're going back to stuff that we did in the 1940s with the internments of Japanese uh, civilians in this country because we thought that they were conspirators in World War II. <clears throat> well, yeah. Did you hear uh, uh, Maisie Hirono, um, <clears throat> representative from Hawaii this week? I did, I did not. Uh, she got asked on that question. Man, that woman is something, I'll tell you that. Um, and uh, they asked her about that. Right. And she basically came around. So let's call them what they are. Prison camps. Right. We're putting children in prison camps. Right. And, as, you know, they basically said there is no you know, they said we, this could never happen again. And look, it's happened again. 
and look, you know, this is why, you know, again, I, I hate to say this, say it like this, but look, um, the, the whole, the days of, you know, waiting for, you know, I don't know, better days to come or people will come to their senses or wait for adults in the room. Any of those things you want to say, though, that those days are gone. This, th- those, those are just phrases that we use when we had the, we had the luxury of referring to some sort of infrastructure that was mildly within the bounds of humanistic values that is gone once you cross this line that's gone and there's no coming back from that and what people have to remember is that mitch mcconnell in the senate and paul ryan in the house could have stopped this in a snap and they chose to do nothing because they're getting their tax breaks they're getting their corporate feedbacks they're getting their kind of racist nonsense going through and they don't have to wear the egg on their face they're allowing trump to do it right and trump is the perfect person for that because he's such a scumbag to begin with right that they they could just let him take all the eggs and take all the thing meanwhile they do nothing they are the enablers that allowed this to come forward that is a party that is fully corrupted and has allowed this stuff to perkle up and we've got nothing else and we're going to need a democratic party that is capable of fighting back to this and one of the things i think we need to acknowledge is like this would not have been an issue if it wasn't for ron wyden from from Oregon, right? Is that is, am I thinking of the right? Is that the right person? Was I, I, it Wyden? Was it if, if it wasn't for that senator going down to Texas to the border and demanding entry into a closed Walmart to see what is going on in these in this detention center? If it wasn't for him to do that and make such a publicity stunt out of that, this would not be. We, I, I don't think this would be an issue right now. Merkley. I don't think this. Merkley, yeah. Merkley. If it wasn't for Merkley. You know, going down to the um, to to the to Texas to make this an issue, and saying I am a U.S. senator, I demand entry into this center to see what the conditions are like, and keep on pounding them on social media, and not and people then like starting to say, oh wait, this is a detention center. It's listed as a nonprofit, and the director of this is getting eight hundred thousand dollars a year in government contracts, and then you had Democrats in in um, New Jersey demanding entrance into another facility i mean it as it it took those actions for this to finally become an issue and then it took the whistleblowers to step up this this past week and really ramp it up again yeah exactly but, and you like, know what? This, this this was only like a five or ten minute clip on msnbc yep when people were talking about it then the the audio came out yep you know maybe you're right merkley was the first one down and like check this out though you know so maybe we should be asking other questions too as well right uh, like on the democratic side of things right and we can we can rehash all the arguments about kind of why we talk about the democrats on this program if you really, really want to do that everybody um but maybe the democrats maybe people in the democratic party or at least are kind of invested in reforming the democratic party might start looking to people like jeff merkley right to lead the senate instead of chuck schumer right like where the hell's chuck schumer been in all this Right. Where's Chuck Schumer and the leadership of the Democratic Party been in all of this? Right. Yeah. They've been on nice little talk shows here and there signing their reason, the reason call. But, you know, Sean, I, you know, I was going through and I was looking at some audio this week. I wanted to see what Chuck Schumer had to say about all this stuff. And I came across some audio from 2009. Right. Which shows you exactly why. Right. The centrist Democrats and why this corporate infrastructure has infested the Democratic Party needs to needs to end, too, as well. This is 2009 in the wake of the worst financial collapse in this nation's history. Right. This is Chuck Schumer. Right. Giving a speech at Georgetown Law. Right. On, quote unquote, illegal immigration. And I want you to stay and listen to this entire clip because it shows you some of the ways that these kind of like people, these Democrats that think you need to go to the center constantly on the march rightward have been complicit in setting this table that we are living in right now. This is Chuck Schumer from 2009. We must create a system that converts the current flow of primarily low-skilled illegal immigrants into the United States into a more manageable and controlled flow of legal immigrants who can be absorbed by our economy. Let me elaborate. The first of these seven principles is that illegal immigration is wrong, plain and simple. There you go. Until the American people are convinced that we will stop future flows of illegal immigration, we will make no progress. You mean like right now, Chuck? Dealing with the 
millions of illegal immigrants who are here now. Here, here comes my favorite part. And on rationalizing our system comes of legal part. immigration. It's plain and simple and unavoidable. When we use phrases like undocumented workers, we convey a message to the American people that their government is not serious about combating illegal immigration which the American people overwhelmingly oppose. So what you call them, Chuck? Infestations, maybe? Animals? If you don't think it's illegal, you're not going to say it. I think it is illegal and wrong, and we have to change it. Above all else, the American people want their government to be serious about protecting the public, enforcing the rule of law, and creating a rational system of legal immigration that will proactively fit our needs rather than reactively responding to future waves of illegal immigration. You got that? So there you go. Chuck Schumer from 2009 playing the good political card to basically take away ground from the right by sounding like he's tough on immigrants and using that language too as well. There you I, go, And folks. you know the best thing about that video, that sound clip was? He was using undocumented immigrants to pit them against working class Americans. Exactly. You know, it, to, to bring in... I mean, he was using that like frame like to pit these people and really like the labor unions and the left and the democratic establishment needs to get together. Like the largest growing demographic of people within working unions, within labor unions are single mothers are women of color and are Latina women of color. They are the largest exploding demographic within the unions, all labor, all immigrant labor, all immigrants is labor. Pretty much at this point, they're going to be the, the face of labor. It's going to be immigrants. It's going to be black and brown women, single mothers that are going to be in that, that are the face of labor. And if we don't like and if we keep on supporting Democrats like Schumer and stuff like this, we will get nowhere. Right. And if our if, and, and if we make these arguments saying, well, we can't close down these detention centers because there's unionized prison guards there. What, what about them? Well, what, what about the families that have been stuck there indefinitely? What about them? Do, do they not have rights? They, they, I mean, like these people will become part of the labor force and will be, become union members. Look, this, and this, this is a this is a, a you know, look, this is a, a, a calling of accounts um, for the labor movement, too, as well. It's like, you know, that we talked about this on the show about how we're like, like, look, the fact that you had labor unions, my union included, endorsing the Costas. Right. Dom Costa in, part in particular into that race. Right. In Pittsburgh. Right. And I don't want to look. I don't want to go overboard here and paint Costa in terms of like a racist bigot because I don't believe that. However, he had these anti-immigrant policies that were going out and talking about pitting immigrants against labor. Right. Immigrants against workers. And then Brett Banditelli. I'll never forget this. Brett Banditelli. Right. From the other side of the other side of the nation. Brett Banditelli gets on Twitter after I kind of was like, sending this stuff out. And he was basically saying, he says, I will never understand why the labor movement can't get it through its head that immigrants and labor are, labor. are the same freaking thing. When you're talking about immigrants, these are the people who are working in the bulk of the jobs. Across. I mean, whether you're talking these are about people working in the fields 12 hours a day, picking your picking your food, picking your spinach, picking your strawberries, your oranges, your stuff like this. These are people doing jobs that white Americans will not even fathom doing. Right. And we're attacking these people. <clears throat> and also, we should say this. Legal immigration is is maybe like a, a made up a made up issue within the past 50 years within the past i mean we like your your parent your family didn't come here legally yeah it was legal because there were no immigration guidelines up they came in they got off the boat and they went into the cities that's right that that's pretty much how there was no well, well my my family went through ellis island bullshit your family didn't go through ellis island your family came off the dock either in philadelphia boston or new york or the, or the cities along the coast and they went and they lived in those cities. Look, and I, I, I look at this. Look, I grew up. I grew up in a city, right? That at least at my part of the city that was predominantly Italian. All right, and it's like this is where the Costas should be. Like they should freaking remember this history too, as well. Is that the derogatory statement for for Italians were wops without right? papers? Without papers, right? And I grew up knowing that story, right? Because because so many of people that I grew up with in my neighborhood. Right, were first, were usually second generation immigrants, and their grandparents remember that. 
right? They remember what that same did. Thing in, same thing in, in Philadelphia. I went to high school, Roman Catholic high school in Center City, Philadelphia. A lot of the people came from Roxborough, Maniunk, and South Philly, and Second Street in South Philly. And for those of you who don't know the divisions in Philadelphia, or especially South Philadelphia, um, Sec 2 Street is where all the Irish live. Cause they, and there, there's even like racial breakdowns between two streeters and everyone else, the Italians in South Philly. But you know what? Those are all second generation, third generation Americans. And they remember, they know what a WAP is. Yep, that's right. <clears throat> because exactly. They, because a WAP is what their, what their parents or grandparents were called. That's right. And, you know, I wanted this, my message once again. I want to be clear. This is what happens. This is what happens when you have um, progressive institutions, labor organizations, things like this that get too comfortable in their positions and their recruitments of power. Right. It's also about, you part, have, about, yeah, part, about part of this system. Right. This is where you actually have to get back to some of the roots of this stuff to go back to the Debs approach to this stuff. Let's remember in September 18th, 1918, when, you, when Eugene Debs was arrested. Right. When he was being convicted for violation of the Sedition Act. Right. God forbid for standing up and support. Of the, this is what he said. His first lines. He goes, years ago, I recognized my kinship with all living things. And I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then and I say now that while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. And that should be the mantra and the spirit by which that we operate and kind of defend our kinship with other human beings, not pitting one group against another for political expediency to try to win like a district race in one particular part because you're worried about it. Dude, dude, kid, no, you build your connection on those principles or you cannot call yourself a progressive stalwart of the working class in my mind. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> And and one of the things that's also going on right now, um, you know, we, we're railing against the Democrats. You know, there's a fight for the heart and soul of the party going on right now in New York City. I'll say. Um, Alexand- Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is going up against Joe Crowley, who is literally the next in line to be Speaker of the House if Democrats are to retake the House. And you know what she said? Do tell me. Well, I seen, seen some of the videos this week. She went after Crowley for supporting ICE. You know, back in 2003 for voting for the for the for creating ICE. You know, like for she went down to the border this past week. She's endorsed by our revolution. She's endorsed by DSA, and Crowley is running for his political life. And one of the things I don't get, you know, liberals like, well, we can't get rid of ICE. We have to protect this institution. Bullshit. You know what the Republicans fucking campaigned on? One of the things they campaigned on the past five or six years or since the Obama era, beginning of the Obama era, defanging and declawing the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Bingo. Why the fuck can't we do that with ICE? We could. Well, did you hear, did you hear what else that happened just this past week? This, is, this, guy, this was so buried in the bottom of the news that the new proposals coming out from the Trump administration is to combine, combine yeah, merge the Department of Education with the Department of Labor. Right. And you know what that means? That is the step towards eliminating the effect effectivity of both of those of both of them. Right. So don't tell me we have like there's nothing you can do. It's an institution. They're doing it, folks. They're taking a wrecking ball to institutions that will protect the livelihood of working Americans. You know, like while Democrats, well, we can't abolish ICE. We can't do that. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. (laughs) Remember that one? Remember that? Remember that Obama ites? I'm yeah. telling you, you know, and, and our, we really have to rethink our immigration policy. It should be an administrative arm. It, it should not be a law enforcement. There should not be a law enforcement wing of our, of our, of our immigration policy. Look, I, it should be administrative. It should be an administrative, like the department of labor or the department of education. It right. shouldn't be like under Homeland security. No. And exact, exactly. Right. And the thing is like, say, like I, I think about, I could come up the top of my head, Lots of different solutions like to all this stuff. You have an administrative agency, which is about kind of processing. It's a fairly bureaucratic process, right? And we could talk about streamlining the process, all that kind of stuff, right? But you're exactly right. There should not be a law enforcement kind of like wing of stuff. Now, we want to make sure that, okay, you don't have kind of very, very like, you know, terrorists that are kind of sneaking in and using loopholes. and Okay, fine. So you find a mechanism to kind of ensure that there's some, there's some talking or something like which that. Which doesn't happen. 
No, no, no. But I mean, that's what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? I mean, th- the point is, ICE is about racist patrolling of the borders, period. It's a terrorist organization that is being supported by the United States government. And when Americans begin to wonder why the hell is it that people in other countries look to us as no longer being able to trust what we will do with our government, this is why. This is why. But you're right to point to that race, Sean. You're right to point to uh, what is happening in that kind of New York race with Ocasio-Cortez um, and Joe Crowley. I mean, I think it is set up for exactly this discussion to be front and center for that campaign. Yeah. And it's Tuesday, right? Yes, yeah, so this Tuesday is the congressional primaries in New York. <sighs> Have yeah, you New, York's one of those weird, New York's one of those weird states where the congressional primaries happen June. I think, what, the, the state primaries happen in... State and locals happen in September? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Man. So have you seen any polling that's come out of that race? I have not. But it seems like from uh, the, the videos that um, – it seems like the videos that have come forward uh, shows that um, – uh, shows that – whatchamacallit – shows that Crowley is running for his political life. He's scared. He was begging Ocasio Cortez for support if she, if she, he was to win the primary. After he said he would support her, and she's like, "No, I will have to take this to a vote to the organizations that I am not a campaign. I am endorsed by many people, and if they want me to endorse, we would have to take a vote to that and to the DSA, to our revolution, to Black Lives Matter." This is it, right? This is what happens when your politics is connected to a movement and not a party. Not yeah. a corp. Well, look, and it may be at one point that you could have a party that that could be part of a movement. But the way that the Democratic Party is set up now, that's not it. And that's exactly when Sean is talking about, you know, the struggle for the soul of the Democratic Party this is exactly what you're talking about. Where who g- gives authority and power to that party? Is it going to be the movements that are that are bursting up across this country? Or is it going to be the corporate donor class that the DCCC continue wants to push down? Right. That's the question that all of us. Right. That when we're here in the progressive things are working out, are trying to work out, are fighting through. Right. And just to make sure not to put too fine of a point about where we started today. Yes. Right now we're talking about the Democrats. But the only reason that we're having that discussion is because the Republican Party has fully, wholly sold out to nationalist, racist scumbaggery. They are gone. That is a party that has to be put in its grave as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I mean, this week, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to talk about it on the state side, state of things, but Scott Wagner decided to have dinner with Mike Pence earlier this week. <laughs> great. Let's talk you about know, that. Let's talk about that in our second segment, because I want I, I, I think it'd be a great little uh, um, because I, I also know that you uh, spotted um, uh, Wagner doing some more uh, work around town this week. So we got to talk about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me throw in a couple things here, too. I mean, like, I, I mean, like, look. I had I'll tell you, people, I said I started a list of, for today's show um, last Sunday um, of different stuff that was coming up. There is so much that is going on right now um, in terms of uh, like additional guts of the EPA. Um, look, I just mentioned there attacks about- on the attacks against the ACA and Medicare and Medicaid yep. this week. The Republicans passed a bill out of committee yesterday while Melania Trump was wearing her jacket. Exactly. About the merging of the Labor Department and the the, uh, the Department of Education. I mean, there's so much that was going on. But look, how do you. But hey, we we can't defang ICE. Well, I mean, this is it, right? I mean, the the fact is that things that are, you know, there's this point and like, you know, like I look, look, I watch the Rachel Maddow show like pretty much, I don't know, probably four, at least four nights out of a week. Right. And. Um, I used to absolutely love her show and a lot of the ways that she broke down arguments and things like this. And it's been kind of hard to hang in there as kind of like a one consistent touchstone for a while because everything has gone to Russia, 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 Russia. Right. Um, but there, there was this one thing about staying with that show for a while and just kind of continue to watch it was that, you know, every day she'd come on and be like, well, we had a whole show planned and that just got thrown out about an hour, an hour and a half ago. Right. And there was this sense of like, yeah, oh my God, is this craziness? But now the craziness is so normalized, right? That it's happening all the time. 
that the stuff is that, that's actually slipping through the cracks that doesn't even see the light of day, right, are things that two years ago would have been front page news and scandalous. And that stuff, we literally, the resources aren't even there to cover that stuff half the time right now. Especially when you've got something like this. I mean, you're taking kids from parents. When I heard the report about how these kids, they, they, they're crying their eyes out. And the, the regulations are that those workers that are there, they can't even, like, console the kid. And if the kids try to console each other, those workers have to break them up. So they've been stripped from their parents, and they're stripped from human contact. I mean, this is disgusting. That's, that's where we're at. But I, I do want to mention just a, a, a couple really big things that are going on right now, right? Um, it's like, number one, we thought I thought this was going to happen today, right? It could have happened as early as yesterday. I thought this was going to happen today. This huge ruling that is going to affect public sector workers um, um, across the country, that's probably, you know, we're, everything's expected to go against public sector workers. The Janice V. Asme case, right? The Janice case. Um, we're waiting to hear the ruling for the Supreme Court. Apparently, there's uh, four cases that came down earlier today, uh, right as we were, we were kind of getting ready to accord. Um, Janice was not one of them, so they're looking for this to drop on Monday. Um, and that will be the one that will basically, you know, you know, get rid of about 50 percent, 45 percent, 40 percent of the revenue of public sector um, unions, right? Um, unions who have uh, not exactly been... Um, um, spending the last 20 years um, kind of organizing their members for a people power movement, right? Um, so work is cut out for this, and it's going to be a huge blow for my union, um, ABSCUF, um, AFSCME, SEIU, uh, AFGE, whole range of other um, um, unions that are affiliated with the public sector workers, right? So that's coming Monday, folks, so keep an eye out for that. The second thing that I thought was really kind of important to point to today um, was that there was a, uh, I thought I pulled the audio, but I guess I didn't. Um, there, Sinclair Media, uh, we've talked about them before on this show. Um, Sinclair Media uh, um, basically um, ordered all of its affiliates, and they've been buying up um, TV stations across the country, right? Um, again, thanks for a favorable ruling for the FCC, the same FCC that gave us the, um, um, uh, the end of net neutrality. Uh, Simclair Media uh, as a right wing um, kind of organization that's buying up this stuff and basically forcing all of its affiliates um, to read coordinated messages um, that, um, you know, as a condition of their employment. Right. And these are kind of coming out of basically a right wing kind of think tanky organization at Sinclair Media so that all these messages are being read the same message at local affiliates across the country without those people that are tuning in actually knowing that this is like a political message basically. And so what Sinclair did is they basically came out and they said that um, all this stuff about the child separation stuff is basically the media's fault for overreacting about child separation. Um, and uh, there's some audio out there. I'll, I'll have to put it in the, into the show notes. Um, there's some audio out there um, that kind of shows you what this has actually looked like this past week. So there are coordinated immediate efforts on the ground um, to kind of push back uh, against this resistance in ways that the people watching it don't even know that it's actually political, resi- political pushback. It's crazy. Um, yeah, so I don't know what else. Like, so we, didn't, we, didn't, we need to talk about Manafort and all this other garbage, do we, Sean? <laughs> Now, <laughs> Elon Musk is basically a blip on the screen today. Yeah, right. I thought it was going to be fun talking about him, but. Yeah, well, you know what? Not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some stuff in PA. Um, going to get into a little bit more. I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll start to kind of ed- kind of lean towards fun stuff after the rage of the first section. All right, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Uh, if you want to help support progressive pull no punches, homegrown media, invest in Raging Chicken Press. Go to patreon.com slash RC Press and become a member today for as little as five bucks a month and help keep the rage going. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder. We'll be right back. <laughs> I'm 
I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1999. That was the day 5,000 textile workers at Six Fieldcrest Cannon Mills in North Carolina began voting for representation by the Union of Needle Trades Industrial and Textile Employees, better known as UNITE. The victory, later validated by the NLRB, was a significant win for labor in the anti-union South. The union's organizing director, Bruce Rahner, stated, quote, It feels like we just organized GM. Suddenly, we've got a beacon to show other textile workers that they can do it. Labor historian Leon Fink noted that, quote, It's a stunning victory for the union. It's the biggest breakthrough in a traditional Southern industry for probably the last quarter century. Then AFL-CIO President John Sweeney remarked that it was the largest union victory in a Southern textile mill in history. The election and victory came after 25 years of struggle and four previous attempts to organize at Fieldcrest Cannon Mills. Many noted that the young immigrant workforce made the difference. Conditions had been worsening at the mills. Workers fed up with production line speed up, punitive decreases in piecework premiums, and company harassment were compelled to vote union. One worker stated that he and many others were sick of lies management told to keep workers from voting yes in previous elections. Supervisors routinely intimidated workers to vote no with promises of higher wages or, when that failed, threats of deportation. Workers were barraged with various forms of anti-union propaganda. They found anti-union videos mailed to their homes. Some were paid extra to distribute Vote No t-shirts on the shop floor. The company finally recognized the union and negotiated a first contract that guaranteed higher wages, pensions, and other benefits. Welcome back to Raging Chicken's Out the Coop podcast. Meanwhile, in Pennsylvania. For our state, where the Declaration of Independence was read and signed, we imprison families, families, at the Berg's Family Detention Center outside of Reading, PA. When the call to the shutting down of Burke's family detention began in 2015, yet it still remains open, this is family separation in our state and our nation. Separation of families at the border was the most pivotal point to see that there were earlier signs of atrocity that began to go, yet we failed to see. But now that we see, we must understand that although together in detention families are kept, it is still inhumane. Although we may call family detention centers, they are prisons. And there you go. That is a uh, short bike ride from Kutztown University where I teach the Burke's Detention Center. What's going on here, Sean? Um, So that was Maria Cruz Hernandez uh, from MILPA which is the Movement of Immigrant Leaders in Pennsylvania. Um, It's an immigration group. Uh, She was speaking at a press conference yesterday morning uh, that was put together by Pennsylvania State Senator Vincent Hughes um, to call out and detest what has happened here. Um, A bunch of Democratic legislators were there for the uh, 9 a.m. press conference. Um, So uh, there was was a resolution in the House and Senate denouncing these. I do not believe they got a vote. I did not see anything. But... um, uh, there's a really renewed push to close down um, the Burke's Detention Center. Um, a lot of the people out here say this is a human rights issue. Um, if we remember about a year or two ago, a bunch of people from Make the Road Pennsylvania and other immigrant groups uh, were arrested for blocking traffic in front of the Pennsylvania Capitol uh, to demand this to be shut down. Um, what, they, what these activists want is the governor's office to uh, file an ERO, um, I guess some sort of lawsuit, uh, that would take this to the courts and remove their lease. Uh, they, they feel that the governor's office has filed EROs for less um, with the home health care workers and other issues, but they have not uh, moved through with this, which um, the activists said that they were promised over a year ago, that the governor's office would go through with this. So what's the word from the governor's office on this? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I don't know where the governor's office is at right now, <laughs> but 
I so know they haven't. It's not like they've they've come out and speaking out on this um, about what their position is in the Berks Detention Center, basically. Uh, no, um, this looks like this is an issue that they don't want to talk about that much because of it being an election year. Well, you know, I tell you, I was. And uh, that, that's the only. That is the only thing I could see because it's a controversial issue in their eyes. Mm-hmm. I was waiting to see what was going to happen the other night when. Um, you had the first two governors, what was it, Colorado and Massachusetts. The first two governors basically um, signed orders that said that no state resources, um, well, in one case, it was no state resources would be would go to aid um, the separation of children from their families um, kind of on the border. Um, and then the other one was the kind of like the no, no National Guard troops um, kind of would be sent or they were recalling those National Guard troops. And then um, those those two states went first. And then other states started coming in. This is actually during the Rachel Maddow show. More states were kind of coming in. More statements from governors were coming in. And I was waiting to see what was going to happen um, in Pennsylvania. But, um, you know, like these statements that are coming in are exactly what they are, statements. They are, I mean, like we're, we're talking about recalling National Guard troops. Like what, you count them on all 10 fingers? Maybe even if you include your toes? Like now people, like, you know what I mean? Like it's it's not like we we – we're sending hundreds of people down there to do this. These are these these are these are symbolic statements at the well, very at, at, at the most. That well, have I know I don't little... I disagree. Not at the most, right? I do believe that it is about yes, there's symbolic, right? But like let, let let's let's say what this meant. Yes, that's you're absolutely right. I mean, this is not going to cause the end of it. It's not going to be these governors that are going to do this, right? However, when when you're basically sitting in there, this is the call out of like okay, as a sitting governor, right? Do you, right, just sit back and say, not my problem. I'm a governor of a state. I have nothing I can do, right? Or do you do start to do things, right, that signal which side you're on, right? Because this is a which side are you on moment, right? And so the fact that they started coming out and do this and putting other government, that puts political pressure. So it's symbolic, but it's also political. And in some cases, like in, the, in New York State, this is what I'm really interested to see what's going to happen. Because Cuomo came out and signed on to this, too, as well, or kind of basically gave out his own statement because they found out. I, I can't remember if it was I don't know if it was if it was ProPublica or Mother Jones. I don't remember. But they the big one of the big questions this week has been, where are the girls Right. And they started uncovering some of these kind of girls only detention centers of children in New York and Long Island. Right. So they're being shipped from the border up to New York. So now you've got New York state resources being used to detain like little girls that have been stripped from their parents. So. If this is going to have any teeth, now the pressure is you come out and you made the statement. Then it says then they've got to shut this thing down. So. I was waiting to see what was going to happen with Wolf, and it came out real late, right? But he did come out, like his office at least came out and put out a statement that about no National Guard troops or something like this. But this is the opportunity to kind of push this guy, right? You know, um, Governor Wolf, and basically, no, look, which which side are you on? It's like you and have push to me make... over to the window to the left. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I talking to a couple of state reps, um, they are concerned about the, the detention center um the they're, they're they're concerned about the the detention center in Berks County but they're they're also questions well what happens after we close it they just get thrown right back into the system and they go somewhere else and that's kind of like their 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 uh their 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 reasoning for making making sure that they're treated with the most upright right. it's the freaking margaret dignity. thatcher line this shows you how deeply freaking like the neoliberal garbage has gotten into our vocabulary there's nothing we can do there is no alternative unfortunately this is what the way the world is so it's too bad for us we have to move on so they can preserve their own kind of moral clarity for themselves as individuals while at the same time allowing the practice to continue that's garbage right you can tell me you can sit there they can sit there and they can spend all this time about figuring out ways to sue the supreme court about gerrymandering issues and deal with that kind of garbage but they can't come up with a solution for facilitating right a kind of like a return to humanity i don't buy it yeah, well, <laughs> and um, you want to know, some of the things that uh, was interesting from yesterday's press conference. Uh, You're going this, to the jail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maria Cruz Hernandez was the one who spoke there. She gave a speech about this, and I don't know if it was willingly or unwillingly, but 
um, Senate Minority Leader uh, Jay Costa actually thanked Maria, actually called her out by name in this protest it, it, at this press conference to thank her for her impassioned speech, her passion. And, you know, um, either it's um, it could be looked, a little, looked at like a slight endorsement for supporting her stance to close down the uh, Berks Detention Center. But he thanked her. And on the ground, there are a growing number of candidates running for House in southeastern Pennsylvania who are joining the calls with DSA, who are DSA members, who are getting behind this, and who want this closed down. And the thing is, whether the Wolf campaign or the Wolf office likes it or not, this is about to become a big election issue because there are now going to be House candidates calling for this to be closed down. There are House candidates who are protesting for this to be closed down. There are people this 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 past primary season. We've saw that primaries have consequences. The Democratic Party has been pushed to the left on this issue. And there are a lot of left leaning candidates on the ballot in Philadelphia and the suburbs of Philadelphia where these people are going to be joining these calls to close down the Burke's detention center. And you're doing this in, in Republican held districts too. Yep. Yep. Cause they're not afraid of the backlash. Well, then this is a perfect example of some of the, the lack of political spine that has, has really defined a lot of Pennsylvania politics for a little bit too long, right? That whole idea is like, well, look, we, we just, we'd rather not just talk about it because if we talk about it, then the Republicans are going to make an issue of it. And therefore we're going to lose the election. Like that's the way that they think. Or right. that AFSCME is going to be losing members from this, and they don't want to close down because exactly. AFSCME is going to be losing union jobs. Right. This has been. This has actually been exactly the, every time that we've brought up this issue. We, about we, a, we can't close down prisons in this state because we don't want to use. We don't want to lose union jobs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like fuck the pris- the exploding prison population. We don't want to. St- we don't want to stop that because we're not, we're going to lose union jobs over this. Right, and it's the it's the it's a, it's the surest way to make the union movement irrelevant, right, for the future, right? Instead of actually getting behind a strong pressure for oh, I don't know, renewable energy, right, where you can actually build out an entire infrastructure with guess what, union jobs. No, you're going to take the easy road out in ways that you're going to not offend or concern too much the Republicans, and that is going to define your discourse. Or union leaders within the within the Democratic establishment. No, I'm I'm grouping them all together. Yeah, right. I'm group, but I mean, this is this is all. I mean, yes, you, you, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry, I'm getting far ahead of that. But I'm saying like, yes, but but part of it is like you don't want to kind of piss anybody off here. You don't want to force everybody to this. And but you know, look, union leaders do the same exact thing. Right. To their own members. Like, I can't tell you how many times that we've heard this. We've heard this from like our own union work in our terms of exposing budget fraud at universities at, across the state. Like our union is concerned that if we start talking about the realities of budget fraud, which we have documental evidence that this is happening. If we do that, then the Republicans are going to use it and then all of our funding is going to get pill- get pulled. And it's an automatic conclusion as opposed to defining the discourse and the political and, and the political agenda. Nope. We're going to stay within the existing universe and keep things as they are to preserve everything as they are. And hopefully that we're going to be able to keep the crumbs that we got. That is a losing proposition, folks. A losing proposition. Crazy, man. Well, I'm looking at actually NBC Philadelphia has actually been picked um, has been picking up some of this discussion about the Burke's detention center. So this is I mean, this is actually pretty good. I just, you know, I also mm -hmm. I also know of talking to people in the newsroom. uh, There's going to be a push. I think I think journalists in the newsroom are going to start digging their teeth into this from the conversations that, that, that have been had. So. Well, it's good because, you know, like you have a story that just broke two days ago, right, that a Berks County man faces up to 25 years behind bars for the sexual abuse of juveniles at the youth detention center where he worked. How about that? Right. Maybe how many how many of these kind of workers here, how many of these kind of workers um, that are in there are maybe maybe there. I, I should be I should be really I, I should be really clear about this. Right. Uh, let me I, I'm conflating two things here. I want to say this guy is here. The story this goes broke. This was not at that immigrant detention center. Let me be clear about that. That was a youth um, kind of intervention center in Lancaster. Right. But the fact is, these kind of environments. Right. Are not these pure spaces. Right. And abuses occur especially when you're dealing with children, right? And when you have something like ICE running kind of detention centers or private corporations running these detention centers or these things that really the The public- The Geo Group. 
yeah, the geo group who do, you know, and we do not necessarily want the rest of the public doesn't want to look at what's going on there because they're immigrants. Right. I can guarantee you that this is the kind of thing that you can expect at these detention centers. Right. This is why uh, just one more reason about why this stuff needs to go. Yeah. Crazy, man. And speaking about immigrants, uh, our boy Scott Wagner. Yeah. Had a uh, had a uh, fundraiser this week with uh, Mike Pence that brought in six hundred thousand dollars. And he thousand dollars. He decided to have dinner with people who, uh, you know, r- are ripping families apart. Let that putting sit, people, let that sit there with you for this. Putting kids in cages. And if you look at uh, who uh, Scott Wagner hired as his communications director, Andrew Romeo, um, he worked for Ed Gillespie in 2017. And, uh, you know, Ed Gillespie beat the neo-Nazi in the primary that is now uh, running, who won the, just won the primary for uh, the Virginia Senate. So he's a hero. So he's a hero. <laughs> but uh, Gillespie <laughs> ran a hard right campaign attacking immigrants. There's just no getting around this. This is it, folks. Front and center. Front and center. <laughs> this is this is this is this is where we're at, man. This is where we're at. I think it's you know one at the very least. You know, we talked about in this moment, it becomes important to be disruptive of this any way any way that you can. Yes, obviously. I, what Sean really was saying, calling your calling your representatives, calling your senator, make sure that that's going out. But basically, also, you know, this this is true of our organizations. This is true of our parties, right? I mean, I look at this and I say, like, if this is not the 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 I don't know the starkest reminder, right? Or should be the starkest reminder going forward that never again. Should a labor union or should a progressive organization or at least a labor or union who pretends to be progressive ever endorse somebody that has anti-immigrant policies on the books, right? Simply in order to maintain some sort of kind of like leverage, right, within the elections or simply for political expediency. That's days have to be done. Yeah. Or endorsing Republicans so they could have a voice in the caucus. Yeah. You know. Well, we want to, Sean, we want to have everybody's, everybody's uh, voice included because, hey, let's not forget. Oh, he's a doctor. <laughs> that's really important. You know, he's got a degree, Sean. He's got a degree and he's very important. Oh, he's and a one doctor. Of the things saying, <laughs> what? Um, one, one of the things. Yeah. No, I, I'm good. Sean <laughs> lost his words. <laughs> No, it was just off topic. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, like you look at like what the unions did. U- unions, AFL-CIO, they all supported um, the person running against Leanne Kruger Branicky inside her uh, special election when she got elected a couple of years ago. Uh, there was that Tea Party person who decided to run a running campaign on the Scott Wagner side, and Branicky won that special election. But like, and now she's become one of the most pro labor people and biggest fundraisers in the Democrat caucus. But they decided to support the Republican opponent just for having that voice in, in the caucus. It's one of those moments. Blows your mind. (laughs) But no, like it's, 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 it's just how our status quo politics in this state works. It's how our institutions act, you know, instead of getting actual good Democrats in office, these institutions would, you know, prefer a Republican, moderate Republican over a Democrat. Just to keep the Republican caucus sane. Yep. There you go. Instead of let it crash and burn like it should. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, I, I do want to mention this, too. Uh, this just happened, too, as well. We got a 17-year-old African-American um, kid, Antoine Rose, uh, who was... Uh, Shot and killed while running away from a police officer. Yeah. In the back three times. Yeah. And this, uh, and this is... He was, this officer was work, worked in mul- multiple posts, multiple agencies, departments over the past several years. He was sworn in 90 minutes before the shooting happened. 90 minutes? 90 yes. minutes. His career with the East Pittsburgh Police Department was 90 minutes long. Before he shot someone. Yeah. I, what do you do with that? 
Let that sink in. You're so eager to get on the job to kill somebody? That's what you're telling me? And the video clearly states the cop was pulled over. The car was pulled over. You see the kids get out and, and darting. Um, they were trying to say that they, the, this, this, this car fit the description of a shooting that happened in Braddock, Pennsylvania. Um, when that was not the case, uh, Antoine Rose uh, was helping out with um, a food pantry in the area. Um, he was helping out with Giselle Fetterman, who is John Fetterman's uh, wife. Um, and Fetterman, the, both Fetterman's released a statement saying that they are devastated by this, saying that this kid was, he, he, you know, pretty much putting the rest. No, this kid should not. Yeah. Man. It's devastating. And this cop should be, you want some with someone in a cage the rest of their life? This guy, this cop right here deserves to be in a cage for the rest of his life. I mean, and like, and at, at, at a baseline here too, as well, is that if this is not a perfect argument for kind of like a fundamental reorientation of policing, uh, I don't know what is. I mean, this is where you know every kind of like wannabe Larry Krasner that who's out there, um, like, like you know, saddle up <laughs> because uh, uh, we need a a fundamental revolution uh, when it comes to policing. Uh, when it comes to prosecution, um, when it comes to the way that we deal with what we can, can only in the kind of half jokingly way, say, call our justice system today. Um, if we hope that, you know, that system deserves the name that it has, um, it, there's nothing short of a revolution is going to change that. You see this. Nothing and then um, the the one of the people leading the, the protests in response to this is Summer Lee, who was just elected um, out in Braddock, Pennsylvania, to that to the state. Well, she's going to be elected to the state house because she has no one on the ballot running against her. She beat Paul Costa. Um, she was leading the demonstrations against this. Uh, one of the people, or not leading demonstrations, she was involved with it. She was she had this up on her Facebook page last night. Um, she was one of the people protesting on the highway and shutting the highway down after in response to this here kudos to summers lee summer lee out there kind of uh wasn't just about the primary folks wasn't just about kind of like the show for that nope she's still out there on the ground um and bringing the fight right yeah kudos to her um and the one last thing i guess before yeah. we move on the budget oh yeah that's done the budget's pretty much done <laughs> Uh, the budget was passed yesterday. They're going to get the fiscal codes uh, ready. And they, um, I mean, it's a status quo budget. There's you, nothing. You pretty much expect that in election season, yeah. right? Um, there was no budget fight. And, uh, you know, if thankfully Scott Wagner wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> There's well, a big you kumbaya know. moment within the Republican House and within the leadership and everything. This, this budget uh, passed pretty much unanimously in both chambers. Mm-hmm. And there's a big kumbaya moment because Scott Wagner wasn't there to fuck it up. Yeah, there you go. That's awesome. And so, uh, you know, because Scott Wagner has devoted all of his time to, uh, you know, uh, to campaigning. Mowing lawns. Yeah. So we're going to, you know, in the in today's last call, um, Sean um, got an exclusive photograph um, of uh, to, 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 to some of the behind the scenes, the real nitty gritty work of Scott Wagner's campaign. He's getting ready for his new career. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in the fun and in, in the fun. No, I'm not going to go there. Sorry. <laughs> in the last today's last call. Um, the last thing I got for everybody today for uh, for uh, for this segment, um, I want to just take a little time with the, the Colleen Bradley case. I want to say kind of three things about it. Um, one, uh, first, I want to start kind of refer back to what we did in our, our first segment. We talked a little bit about what was happening with Sinclair Media um, and the the absolute importance of um, supporting independent media. And yes, gear up for it, folks, because I'm making another pitch that yes, you should support Raging Chicken Press. You should become a member for as little as five bucks a month. Go to patreon.com slash RC Press. Right. But this is one of these reasons. And look, if you just for whatever reason, you're kind of morally opposed to supporting Raging Chicken Press that or that you're kind of like, you know, you don't see the equivalency between like, you know, one beer, what your craft beer that you drink, whatever, 10 of a month and spending one of those right equivalent of one of those. Um, to help support independent media for whatever reason. Look, whatever reason you got, you don't think this is a good investment. Okay, whatever. Nothing I'm going to do to ever convince you, I guess. Right. But one of the things that you find in any time that you start having moved towards 
um, kind of more authoritarian regimes. And Sarah Kenzior has talked about this over and over and over again. Um, and anybody who's been studying things that happen in kind of authoritarian moves say the media becomes an integral part of that in one way or another. If we're talking about the technical like definition of fascism, right, we're talking about the merging of government and corporate um, entities. Um, that's, you know, one of those markers, right, that you should always look out for. The reason why that you have to support a kind of free and independent press right, is precisely because you want the ability to have the watchdogs, right? Have people paying attention to expose corruptions, both the corruption in the corporate world and corruption in the governmental world, right? So that's kind of like the overall set in the state. So I want to kind of first start with, go back to the Sinclair Media thing real quick, and then I'm going to talk about um, the Colleen Bradley case and where these two things meet. So because of some additional deregulations and some favorable decisions that were brought forth, like I said in the last segment from the FCC, it allowed a kind of like um, Sinclair Media, this, this huge conglomerate, um, a right-wing oriented um, um, media company, has been going up and buying up local stations across the country. Right. Um, and the, one of the features of Sinclair Media is that unlike what you see in some other affiliates, like, you know, you've got Fox News down in, uh, you know, a Fox station down in Philadelphia, um, and they don't necessarily mirror what's happening um, at the Fox, the Fox cable network. Right. So you can have reporting I, on there. What's that? I would say like the, the people from the Fox I, I wouldn't say like they're associated with Fox News. No, that's right? my point. That's my, yeah. exactly my point. It's yeah. like, so even though you've got the brand of Fox, right, it's that what the local Fox News coverage that is happening there is not basically pulling all of its stories from the national cable network, right? It's still local reporting kind of on the ground and everything like that. And by city, the slants may, may be straight down the middle, might be slightly less, slightly right, blah, blah, blah. That's what it's been. Sinclair Media is bringing this brand, this, this new model, which is not so new. It's the kind of thing that the right wing has been cultivating for over 40 years. Um, but in this deregulated environment is buying up stations and basically creating basically national content that appears to be local commentary. Right. So you've got a national kind of like place where the messages kind of are originated. They are shipped off to the local stations that they're basically said you by contract have to read this on your show. So this is a message that you need to do. Right. You need to play ball. Otherwise, these people risk losing their jobs and everything else. Right. Like once again, they've got a choice to make. So what I mentioned and I didn't have the audio for it, but I have the audio now in the last segment. Um, I wanted to play what this sounded like this past week, right? Sinclair Media forced its affiliates basically to, to read this this um, defense of child separation um, commentary on its local affiliates. And what you're going to hear here is it's going to it's going to be moving from um, segment to, or, or from um, local affiliate to local affiliate across the country, right? Um, and it's you'll hear it's the identical message. So here is um, what Sinclair Media forced its um, local stations to read. Hi, I'm Michelle Melby. And I'm Tom Milbert. Our greatest responsibility is to serve our Northeast Wisconsin communities. And we're extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that ABC6 News produces. But we are concerned about the troubling trend of irresponsible, one-sided news stories plaguing our country. The, the sharing, sharing of biased, biased and false news has become, become all too, all too common, common on, social, on media. social media. More alarming, some, some media, media outlets, outlets publish, publish these same these fake stories without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias an agenda to control exactly, exactly what people, people think. 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 This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. At News Channel 3, our responsibility is to report and pursue the truth. We understand truth is neither politically left nor right. Our commitment to factual reporting is the foundation of our credibility now more than ever. But we are human, and sometimes our reporting might fall short. If you believe our coverage is unfair, please reach out through our website. We, we value, value your comments, and, and we will respond. respond. We work very hard to seek the truth and strive to be fair, balanced, and factual. We consider it our honor, privilege, to responsibly deliver the news every day. Thank you for watching, and we appreciate your feedback. So this was done in a... A couple months ago. What's that? From a couple months ago, right? Yeah, it's the one from a couple months ago. I got the wrong audio for it. <clears throat> So, uh, so, anyways, so that's a big fail. But there's, there's a, um, yeah, wah wah. 
Call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, womp womp. Corey Lewandowski, womp womp. We didn't even talk about that. Holy crap. We didn't talk about womp womp. <laughs> I did not see that thing yet. I refused to watch it. Oh, dude, man. It was like disturbing. I don't know about Yeah. Uh, anyways, so that was that was a kind of more generalized piece where you're seeing how these folks were actually kind of being forced to read these, um, read these statements in here. There's a more specific one that had to do with the defense of child deportation. I'm sorry. I wasted your time with that. Um, but that becomes important in part because look, so why local reporting becomes uh, absolutely critical is that there's very often times that most stories, um, that are going to, that have, that end up having kind of national implications, um, end up kind of starting out as kind of local stories. Um, you've heard me, um, and you've heard me talk about it on the show. You've, um, many of you have read my coverage of the Colleen Bradley's case, um, in the pages of raging chicken. Um, and you know that um, this has been a local story. This started with a, a woman who was looking to kind of move into um, kind of, you know, her last career, right? This was going to be the um, the end of her um, kind of working life career at Westchester University when she was hired as um, the um, director of budget and financing um, at, at Westchester University and expected to kind of basically spend the rest of her uh, working life at Westchester, right? Moving up the ranks there and so on. Very shortly after that she, ha- um, she was there, she began to find out um, that um, Westchester was basically um, kind of misconstruing, misrepresenting, um, and kind of putting forth fraudulent statements about its books, about their books, basically claiming that um, they had deficits when they actually were kind of kind of rolling in surpluses um, each year. Right. This is something that I have been reporting on for about a decade. Um, when it comes to uh, things at Kutztown University and Pashi as a whole, um, that what's been remarkable about this is that um, what Colleen Bradley was able to uncover was that this wasn't something that was specific to Westchester University, but she was basically being ordered by people at um, Pashi headquarters, right? Out of the um, chancellor's office in Pashi, she was being ordered to plug numbers into the financials to make it appear as if they had deficits when they actually had surpluses. The purpose of doing that was to ensure that they were going to get the maximum um, state appropriation um, from um, um, uh, from the legislature, all right? That's the background. As that is happening, right, there are some people who say, well, look, you know, funds were being cut and everything like this. I can tell you that's true. Um, but as they were doing that, they were using those same exact numbers, right, to cut faculty members, right, bring austerity measures to every campus, cut staff members, raise tuition on students, like, um, cut academic programs all under the auspices of they had no money, right? They were using the money as a lie to accomplish a different end, right? We saw this at Kutztown University. Other university campuses saw the same thing at the same time that that austerity was being waged, that they were crying poverty, and they were secretly socking away all this money for their pet projects. New buildings were going up, campus beautification projects were happening, and there was no, it seemed to be no end to the money for projects that the administrators, the presidents of the universities actually wanted to accomplish, right? That's that background. Colleen Bradley, was, uh, we tried to expose this here at Raging Chicken Press. We tried to expose this through our local union, and we only were mod- uh, like m- moderately successful. ABSCUF, our state union, actually got an independent audit to kind of basically, which confirmed exactly what Colleen Bradley had um, come out and said, what we had been reporting um, from at Kutztown University too as well. That went virtually nowhere, right? Well, Colleen Bradley basically, she did what no one else was willing to do. She decided to speak up. She had she had knowledge of what was happening. She had evidence. She saved all the emails. She has corroborated every claim that she's done. And I've seen the paperwork. I've seen all the legal documents. I've seen her evidence, right? Um, I've interviewed her, and you've probably seen her. Maybe I hope you've seen her. If you have not already, please go to RagingChickenPress.org. You can click under Special Projects Colleen Bradley. You can see my interviews, video interviews with Colleen Bradley and her lawyer. Well, through a bunch of reasons, which I'm not going to go into all the details now because it's going to bore everyone to piss. And Sean is sitting there saying, okay, I don't want to talk about Colleen Bradley's case anymore. I'm going to wrap it all up because I need to go. Um, what, what basically, um, I'm not going to take you through all the legal minutia of this stuff, but basically um, through some two le- lower court decisions, um, what will happen if her case um, does not move, move forward is that 
30 million public sector workers are end up are going to basically going to lose First Amendment rights at work and their whistleblower protections. Right. Because basically what Colleen Bradley did is she came forward and she exposed what was happening to a broader university community than she was originally sponsored for. She did so um, against the direct um, orders from her boss. Right. Her boss is basically has a, uh, a deposition where he has basically sw- a sworn testimony saying that he no, she was not doing this as part of her job. Well, a district court, um, U.S. District Court, th- the third district court basically said, no, this was her job description, blah, blah, blah. And for a bunch of other complicated reasons, basically what that means is that um, she was fired from her job for exposing this stuff and that she is not going to be granted whistleblower protections if this case stands as it is. And probably the worst of it all, the actual fraud and the corruption has gone on and continues to this day. No one has been held accountable. Right. And the state, Pashi, has not once come forward Right. To actually kind of contest her claims. Right. That's not even been tested in court. This is all maneuvering. So her last bet right right here is um, for what's called a petition for a writ of certiorari. I want to say I hope I got it close there. And basically that is a direct petition to the Supreme Court saying, look, this is an important case. This needs to be heard. That got filed at uh, at the end of May, and uh, we have it here at Raging Chicken Press too as well. And here's the way, these are the two questions that are going to be put before the um, the Supreme Court of the United States, right? Number one, is Colleen Bradley's speech exposing her public employer's false, illegal, and corrupt accounting practices, conduct unrelated to her ordinary job duties or her job description, is that protected as First Amendment citizen speech under these two previous Supreme Court cases, Lane versus Franks and Garcetti versus Ceballos. Number one. Number two, has the conflict among the analyses employed by the courts of appeals, because there's a ninth court of circuit of appeals decision around a very similar case, which went in the complete opposite direction. All right. So has the conflict among the analyses employed by the courts of appeals to determine whether a public employee spoke as a citizen or as an employee on the matter of public concern become so pronounced that it is impermissibly chills valuable speech identifying government corruption by whistleblowers like Colleen Bradley, invoking this court's, the Supreme Court's power to further clarify the analysis of future decision making. So this is how this writ is moving going forward. And so here's basically the nuts and bolts of it. If the Supreme Court says, no, we will not hear this case, right, what happens is that 30 million public sector workers lose a huge amount of their rights under the law, under First Amendment protection of rights at work, right? It basically says that you have to, the only way that you are guaranteed protection is basically if you take all your documents, right, run to the press and expose it to the press, Putting yourself in potential legal jeopardy for exposing confidential information, kind of um, for bringing up on a series of other charges and so on. That'll be your only basic option at that point. The personal cost is so high in that situation, right? Because basically you're saying you have no other options. Everything else, they can fire you and that's it. So you speak up at work, done. That was not the case, right? That was not the case for a long time. These decisions that have narrowed whistleblower protections recently, like in 2006, I want to say, 2004, began 2004, then again 2014, basically these ones are new. It used to be the case that, no, we want to make sure that citizens have access to, to knowing when there's fraud or corruption happening in their government. And the people that are best positioned to expose that are those civil servants that are working in there, like Colleen Bradley. This is a huge case. Right. And I'll tell you right now what needs to happen. Right. Um, which is I, I have to say, it's it's really been surprising to me. I've been reporting this stuff out because we've had a way that we've kind of proceed with raging chicken. Right. We know that we do not have the resources of some kind of like, you know, traditional media sources and journalist sources and things like this, national media coverage and so on. So what we try to do is we try to at least I have tried to do in these kind of cases, report out the kind of concrete facts to get that story and the information out there. So it's more easily accessible to journalists who can pick up the story and have the resources and they can dig into this. What's been surprising to me is there had not been that kind of digging in. What's also been surprising to me is there's been not been more, say, for example, public sector unions, 
right? Um, civil liberties protect, you know, people like from the ACLU and so on like this who have not wanted to uh, jump on this case once this has gone out there. I've tweeted it out to these folks. I've tweeted out this information. So it's not that it's not out there. Right? I've tried to send it directly to kind of particular targeted institutions, and we haven't heard anything back on this stuff, right? which has been surprising. Because basically what would be extraordinarily helpful in a case like this, if you had unions, public sector unions, if you had like places like the ACLU, places like the National Whistleblower Center, right, would file amicus briefs right, in support of what's happening here in Colleen Bradley versus Westchester um, University et al., right? in support of this particular position, right? What's happening though, however, is kind of what we touched upon in our first segment is that everybody is worried if that we actually expose the corruption that is going on, that is going to negatively affect, right? Our institutions, right? Because the right-wing Republicans are going to kind of use it as a way of trying to cut more funds, right? And for me, that is, you talk about such a narrow political horizon, Right. The reduction of political imagination to basically moving pieces around a checkers board um, is crazy to me. This is the same time in the wake of we're watching. We're going to see Janice come down, which is going to what's going to be a huge impact um, to public sector workers. And then now we're going to have a narrowing of our rights to speak at work, our First Amendment constitutional rights at work. Right. If we allow this case, if the Supreme Court does not take this case up and overturn what's happened at the lower courts. Man, this is not a good recipe for disaster. Um, this is a good recipe for disaster, I should say. Right? With everything else that's going on, think about where this fits in that picture, folks. Those people that work for the government are going to be disempowered for speaking out about corruption if this case is not overturned at the Supreme Court. Right? So you're going to see more from me on this one coming up um, kind of in the weeks here. Um, I've been back and forth. I'm going to find out how much of this we can actually put out to the public. I want everybody to be able to see this um, and understand this case. I'm going to be doing some direct content and kind of um, nudging of people along the way. I'm going to try to pull in some resources and basically say, okay, look, um, contact your people and have them get in touch with me. Contact your people and have them kind of get their eyes on this stuff. Um, Because I feel like I'm kind of like shouting in the wind on this one, and it's pretty remarkable. Uh, once you get in to see and understand the implications of this case, 30 million public sector workers, the public's right to know about government um, corruption dramatically curtailed. That's what's at stake here, folks. Anyways, that's my happy note for the end of the day. Um, so look for more on the Colleen Bradley case um, kind of moving forward. Uh, when we come back right after this message, we will be digging into the last call. Oh, we got some Space Force and we've got some dust storms and we got some pot and we got some beer and we got some uh, update on little Scott Wagner. Remember, uh, if uh, you think you've got five dollars to spend, right, to spare in your wallet that's just burning a hole. Um, become a member of Raging Chicken Press um, for as little as five bucks a month. Go to patreon.com slash RC Press. We'll be back right after this. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Over the past six years, we've brought unapologetic, progressive, activist media to Pennsylvania and beyond. We've helped hold those in power accountable and shine a light on some amazing activist work. We've broken national stories and established a reputation as an aggressive, independent media site. As newsrooms close and traditional journalists lose their jobs, hard-hitting investigative news suffers. If we care about our democracy, we have to find new, sustainable models of journalism. And frankly, no one's going to do it for us. After the Trump election, we dug in even deeper. Thanks to some longtime members, one time donations, and a shift in other resources, we brought on more writers and started paying them. Now we're doubling down and want to expand our infrastructure and pay our writers even more. We need to invest in our media if we have a chance to resist the unprecedented assault on democracy, working families, women's rights, and our planet. History will remember the choices we make today. So take a minute to become a member of Raging Chicken Press. For as little as $5 a month, the price of a local craft beer or a cup of coffee, you will be supporting homegrown progressive journalists and media activists. Go to RagingChickenPress.org and click on the Support and Membership tab to become a member. Leave a one-time donation or learn about other ways that you can help. We don't have billionaire backers. Keeping progressive activist media going strong depends on you. 
Thank you for all your help and support. Keep up the fight. is a war fighting domain just like the land the air and sea yes everybody this is kevin mahoney editor and founder of raging chicken press coming back with the last call on out the goop podcast um yes that was uh space force by the gregory brothers and because trump this week basically came out and yet said yes he's going to ordering the official creation of the space force um, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, and don't worry, Air Force. Uh, Space Force is going to come out there, and they will be a separate but equal agency to the, uh, to the Air Force. That's wonderful, isn't it? Uh, Jim Crowing the Air, the Air Force on this one. i got to love it. Huh. Yeah. So, Sean, see this? It's not just me, man. This shit is real. <laughs> I hear, like, once like we start the Space Force, right, and we find some asteroids of mine. Yes, we're going to take the children from these detention centers <laughs> and have them mining these asteroids. Someone's got to go to Mars, Sean. <laughs> Someone's got to go to Mars. Start own penal colony. Well, you know what? The old, you know, Botany Bay, USS Botany Bay. Con! Some people will understand that. Uh, you know, because look, you know, here, here's the deal. The problem is about sending uh, uh, workers out uh, out to uh, Mars and some of these asteroids to mine stuff is that there's a lot of human rights protections um, um, that kind of prohibit us from doing that stuff. Um, but the good news is all these kids and all these immigrants that are in detention are actually kind of in a legal limbo. So really, to the stars, man, to the stars. Yeah. yeah. So, um there you go. This, uh, NASA, is th- this is actually not a joke, though, too, as well. NASA this week also uh, kind of announced its new policy um, to or a, a new plan, basically, to um, divert asteroids. Right. What happens if you have a major asteroid headed towards Earth? How do you do this? And now Trump and some of his spokespeople and some other people even at NASA, from what it's looking like, are basically saying s- the Space Force would have a role in this. So there you go, man. Science and fiction brought together right here in our dystopic future. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Last thing in space news, though, too, as well, um, there's, uh, what's happening on Mars has been actually fascinating this week. There's all this data that's been coming back from the Curiosity rover, which, you know, Curiosity was only supposed to last a couple of years. Uh, I don't even think a couple of years, right? And it's been going on for, you know, got over a decade, I guess, 13 years, I believe, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Well, that's actually been shut down now for the first time because the dust storm, it was a massive dust storm that started on Mars, which has now kind of in- encompassed the entire planet. Right. Um, heads up, Elon Musk. Right. This is what you're actually kind of looking at. So um, so that's actually just kind of fascinating. So if I get a chance of seeing some of the pictures of what that actually looks like, um, there's some like cool time elapsed stuff that's um, that NASA has put up to kind of check out. So um, that's the big news from over there um, outside of our little uh, atmosphere. So but Sean, you had some uh, kind of exclusives this week, which is pretty was pretty incredible. Yeah, I, uh, I, I walked outside my apartment. And I made a left, and I saw the grass was getting mowed on Front Street, and I, and I saw Scott Wagner driving one of those like mowers <laughs> with the with, with like the two handles going forward. Reserve, yeah. He's out there mowing, yes. And you posted a picture of him on Twitter, right? Say, oh look, I there did, he is. Yeah, 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 there there he is out mowing the lawn. I mean, I think he's getting ready for his new career after uh, after November. Oh, I thought this was some kind of secret campaign strategy, right? Just going off to kind of like park by park and go out and mow the lawn. And basically everybody would like like that so Brown much. Brown beat everyone because the grass is too long. Yeah. Look at everyone. Grass too long. Off my lawn. Get off my lawn. Get off my lawn. Go play so, um, with your spidget finner. <laughs> speaking about like front lawns, um, this happened this morning. Uh, Credo and a bunch of other progressive groups in uh, northern Virginia and Alexandria went outside of Kristen Nielsen's home <laughs> and was blasting the audio tape of children crying. I saw out- that. Yes. <laughs> Which is what we should be doing. If you haven't seen this, look up this, look up this. Uh, if you, if you can send me the link, Sean, if you send me the link, I'll put it up. Um, I'll put it up. There's been people, this is actually not the first one. There'd be people going around with, uh, with uh, portable speakers um, and taking that audio from pro um, from ProPublica and just setting loudspeakers outside um, homes and governmental offices um, and people who, who are not speaking out against this stuff and just running that audio at full blast. 
which is what we should be doing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we have. I mean, you know, again, creative disruption, everything, everything, and everything. And this right is how now. you make an issue an election issue, an issue like this, a campaign issue. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, you were, I mean, I'm sure pretty excited about this. I mean, you know, you, you follow this from a purely academic um, kind of approach. And I know that your your scientific mind kicks in on this stuff and you're very <laughs> interested in the policy wonkery around this stuff. But uh, legal pot in Canada, man. Yeah, I, I put up on Twitter the other night after I got in an argument <laughs> with someone that, uh, hey, well, maybe, maybe I should move to Canada, you know, and listen, posting to this link and um, the, the this PR hack. Um, who I was getting it back and forth with because he went into like a both siderisms argument about what happened this week on the border. Okay. Um, said, "Good move," and I retweeted. Replied, it's "Like, good, help me pack." <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Michelle Melby. But and I say within. Sorry, um, I think within the next ten years, marijuana is going to be legal across the United States. Well, we'll see, man. We'll see what happens here with uh, with our, uh, our our governmental infrastructure and our, our constitutional democracy, and then we can maybe we'll talk about that. <laughs> no, it might be. I think. Did you see the flags? I, yes, I did. Yeah, they replaced the red maple leaf with the with the red marijuana leaf. <laughs> the pot leaf was awesome. I thought that was cool as all hell. So that's big news, right? Uh, so yeah, Canada, Canada, whole hog, right? Enough of, enough of this piecemeal stuff. Let's just get this done and kind of move on. Right. So at least if you're kind of out there kind of, uh, you know, uh, digging up dirty oil out there in the sand pits, <laughs> right, you could <can> be stoned. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just it. Uh, crazy, crazy. Well, I got some uh, some some short beer news here. Um, uh, free will. I, I was sick for a good three days out of this week. So um, it's kind of threw off my game a bit. Um especially on this stuff, trying to kind of uh, sample new things. But Free Will um, uh, ha- will host its third Sour Sunday of 2018 uh, this su- this Sunday, and they have got a, a, a couple stuff coming out. One, the Pomisher, which is a sour ale aged um, uh, in oak, oak cask with pomegranate, um, which is fantastic. I love this stuff. Um, and it's got one of the best kind of labels on it. It's kind of like takes like the Punisher, right? But makes it the Pomisher. It's like, you know, like play on that, which is really awesome. But that comes about uh, 6.3% ABV. Um, which is good. And they've got a new, brand new stuff, right? They've got a new one coming out called Blushing Apricot. It's a sour ale aged again in oak cask um, with apricots. And it comes at about a 5.3% ABV. And um, they're both going to be uh, ready for you to enjoy this Sunday um, at either location, either at the main brewery or um, at their other location. I always forget the name of that place out there. Um, the two locations. Look them up at um, Free Will Brewing um, and check them out. They've got some great stuff on tap. They've also got a bunch of beers that, um, that they've got ready and kind of newly canned, um, which uh, I won't go into here, but do please go and kind of check them out. Um, anything else, Sean, for, the, um, you know, uh, for our fun half? Any kind of cool things, observations, pictures, beer? No, nothing's been going on. I just got, I have an assignment to, to do. Yeah. So Sean, this is why Sean really wants to get off. Right. So I know I've been <laughs> giving him a hard time. Uh, he's been a sport because I got started late today because I had a, my kids' doctor's appointments in the morning. So it, it kind of put us back in terms of, I got some reports bit. to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got some reports to do. I've got a, I got some, a couple pitches I have to do, uh, on this, on the Colleen Bradley case. I'm going to start kind of pitching this stuff to cause I'm national audiences because, uh, look, you know, it's that a whole, it's that punk rock, punk rock mentality, man. If no one's going to do it. DIY man, you gotta do it yourself. Right? So, so there it is. Um, so, I'll remind everybody though too as well. Um, if you get a chance, check out our free, uh, our free, yeah, our new podcast called Free Range. That is a, a collaboration between myself from Raging Chicken Press and Colleen Fitzgerald from A Home Stony Run. Um, our new website is called uh, FreeRangePod.com. That's FreeRangePod.com. That's all one word. Um, and uh, it's a, uh, a very kind of simplified minimalist site that is going to be a place that we're going to be posting our podcast. That's where it's going to be hosted. Uh, we originally, you'll, it will, if you subscribe to this podcast and out the coop, you will also get that as part of your feed. Um, that we're going to be reposting it on this um, on our Raging Chicken Radio um, too as well. 
Um, but that's going to be our main site. And on that site, we'll have updated with some um, background of some upcoming shows and so on. And then we'll also have updated Patreon stuff. So if you really like um, the free range, that's where we kind of get into food, politics, and communities of resistance. Um, that um, a lot of, We've had some fantastic responses from our first show. Um, I've gotten great feedback, uh, great emails on it. Uh, it's been really super. We've already got some stuff teed up for um, um, for our next for our next show. Stuff will be coming out there. Uh, we've got some uh, first on location um, um, show that will be kind of coming up in in the fairly near future. We're working out what is, is our our is going to be our you know our schedule in terms of how often we're going to be releasing and so on. Uh, but go check us out at freerangepod.com. That is where you'll get all the news about our free range podcast with Colleen Fitzgerald. Um, and if you want to check out Colleen's work, I mean, you know my stuff if you're listening to this, but Colleen's work, a home stony run, you can go to tracedlines.com. That's traced lines.com and that's each week she writes about these local farms that she's working with some of the farmers that she works with these artists and artisans food artists and artisans and activists um and you can check out all of her recipes reflections photography she's an amazing freaking cook and she posts everything to her instagram account um you can follow her on instagram at mzcc fits that's M-Z-C-C-F-I-T-Z on Instagram. And uh, if you're like me, you're going to go to her site, you're going to check out, and you're going to immediately fall in love with her creations, and you're going to feel like you're um, eating a meal because your mouth is going to start watering within the first two minutes of checking it out. So um, do check out freerangepod.com. Um, that is a new collaboration between Raging Chicken Press and a home stony run. So um, thanks so much. So anything else for the good of the order, Sean? That's it. That's it. All right, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Looking forward to a weekend of growing resistance. Um, I wish you all the best. I hope it is a good weekend. Um, and I will remind you, I'll become a member of Raging Chicken. Go to patreon.com slash rcpress where you can become a member for little as five bucks a month. All right, folks. This is it for now. It's been quite a week. Dig in. Move on. Fight back. This is Kevin Mahoney. See ya! Okay, I'll <laughs> <laughs>